Hi, uh, pleasure to be here. So, uh, for the introductions, uh, I'm going to talk about design patterns for machine learning in production. And uh, the motivation for this talk is that everybody wants to leverage in-house data, and there is a data science expertise available, and with driverless AI, you know, the shortage may be addressed. Uh, so the, the machine learning is becoming accessible, and yet it seems to be very hard to extract a value from machine learning because you still have to put it in production and maintain it. So really briefly, <clears throat> I work at Beeswax. Uh, it's a, a startup in New York City. Uh, we built a uh, real-time bidding platform to buy online advertising at a rate of, say, millions of requests per second, which is not unique. What is unique is that we expose this platform to our customers so that they can take full control of optimization, so they can use their own data science, their own engineering, to uh, basically give us the price that they want to bid on, on, on an ad. Uh, so I will be a little bit biased towards real-time systems, but still gives a perspective from multiple industries where I worked. Okay, so the overall process is kind of simple. We all know it. It's a, we have problem statement. We define the constraints. We know we should know what the value is, what the cost is, and that starts at discovery, and then we go through a series of steps, research, prototype, production. So discovery will tell us uh, why we build what we build and what it does. Research, is it even possible? Prototype, prove that it's possible, and production, actually do it for real. So let's start with defining the problem. And uh, the first question is, what is the right problem we're solving? Because machine learning just gives us a prediction, putting it in, to actual use is a whole different story. So we need to know that first. And uh, a good question to ask ourselves is, suppose we solve the machine learning problem. What is the value of that? Like we have the answer uh, with sufficient accuracy. What does that do? And is machine learning even the right tool uh, to solve the problem? Because you may be able to do a lot with simple averaging. And finally, what are the constraints? Uh, and constraints come from different uh, sides. And existing production environment architecture tends to be a very strong one. Because as a data scientist, I can build a model. And then I go to engineering and say, I want to put it in production. And there is this whole other universe that uh, we have to deal with. Also, available people in their skills. So uh, let's say if uh, the data science team is all R, your production is all Java, it would be kind of difficult to put a system together that is Python. Uh, and then there are requirements for scale. So scale is a whole separate story, and I'll spend much less time than uh, I would like on it. But let's go quickly over this. So a bunch of these. Um, IBM came up with the first three, then they added the, f the fourth, Veracity. And um, I threw in value and vi viability for, uh, for good measure. So this was originally done for an application to data. And uh, I would like to apply the same notion to machine learning. So volume is not just the data that comes in, but also how big is your data set, uh, the training set, I mean. And also, the, the, how, how many points do you need to score? Uh, the training sets might be small because maybe your events are so rare that you need to downsample your, your, from your big data uh, actually go to very small data, and that's okay. Velocity has two components. One is latency, how long do we have uh, to respond with an answer, and also the frequency, how frequently do we need to respond, and also how often do the models change, how often do we deploy models, how often do we change features, how often do uh, we recalculate predictions. Veracity is about uh, accuracy, and accuracy is not just how we measure it, but also how much is enough. Uh, what is the minimum accuracy that actually makes any difference to the customer? And sometimes the answer is not, not a lot, actually. Maybe it's a, your model doesn't have to be perfect, uh, and the business, the business um, problem can be solved with, with something simple. 
Uh, then value is going into, again, suppose we solve the machine learning problem. Uh, what is, uh, what, how does that uh, affect the customer? Uh, viability, so now that we know the value, we have the constraints, we can estimate the costs. And uh, is the cost of satisfying the constraints actually worth the effort? And how, how, how much effort is it to, to build a system like this? All right, so let's move to technical design. Generally, uh, and I'll focus on supervised learning, but it's equally applicable to unsupervised. Uh, we have some data sources. We, build, we have labeled data, we build a model, uh, and then apply a model to unlabeled data set. A very important piece here is that there is a consumer. There is something or somebody that uses that prediction. And uh, this consumer may be a person, let's say a, a city inspector, uh, who, whose job it is to go into buildings and make sure they're fire safe to prevent loss of life. Or it could be high frequency trading model in finance. Completely different. And so the consumer basically defines the constraints of the system in addition to just what systems you already have. So let's look at, uh, yeah, and the design is basically answering all the questions about what are, what are the systems and what are the interfaces between these building blocks. So let's look at the model deployment, the interface between build and building and scoring. And uh, here the key notion is that uh, not only we have a machine learning model, but we also have feature transformations. And the uh, data transformations that we, we do when we do when we create features are um, sometimes models by themselves because maybe it's a PCA or, um, or top and in our case, maybe the top, top thousand domains. Uh, th the definition of, of, of those uh, like top thousand domains, for example, it's a definition, but then there is an instance of that, which is what, what is the top thousand domain, domains, let's say, over the past week. Um, and, so, and we need to store that answer as features and a transformation and map those, so for example, cnn.com becomes feature number 28, right? And um, so we, we need to transfer these transformations from uh, building the models to production to scoring, and that's very important. So uh, a few options there. Uh, the very simple one is everything is in one system. There is nothing happening. Uh, could be a single application where a data scientist uses the, the, the model to, for doing predictions manually, or it's automated in-stream process where, let's say, we uh, enrich our data stream by filling, in, by filling in missing data. We can transfer data only. This is a very effective interface between the two. Uh, if, let's say, we're only doing linear models, anybody can write uh, a vector multiplication <coughs> function. And so uh, we just pass the weights. Hopefully, the transformations are also done. Uh, PMML, anything like that. The code can be independent, but on the other hand, it also means that the code may not be the same. Uh, serialized objects P, uh, through Pico, R, Spark, or you can write your own. And finally, transferring code and data, something like H2O's Pojo and Mojo. In the, in the last case, the code is generated, so we, you, we are guaranteed that it's the same. Um, the only drawback is that you have to deploy code frequently. So this is, this is the kind of thing where data pipeline meets code deployment. And so those are completely different people, usually, uh, and different skills. So data pipeline produces code that has to be then deployed in a uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment environment, and that becomes a problem that is solvable, but kind of new in the space. Okay, so let's uh, look at the scoring systems. And uh, the classical situation is when there is new data, we transform, ap apply the predictions, store in some uh, storage, and then the consumer picks it up and uses somehow. Uh, or we could pre-compute features and shift the prediction to the consumer, give it the model, and uh, then the consumer only uses the features to predict. Um, so 
that that's in batch in single in more real time scenario you probably would have not a lot of data uh, but a single event that comes in maybe an application for credit or uh, an ad online as in, as it is in our in our case and uh, to be the fastest way to implement this is if transformations and prediction happen in process on the consumer in some sort of fast language like Java or C. Alternatively, we could take the prediction transformation out of the consumer and make it a service. Uh, and the service could, be, could live on the same machine, if it's, uh, so, uh, which, which puts some constraints on the, on the types of machines that you, that you use or on a completely different machine, in which case you pay the latency to, for communication. Uh, and uh, for speed, maybe there is a cache um, for to store frequently <coughs> uh, queried uh, predictions. So alternatively, we could, in batch, make all the predictions and populate some sort of real-time cache, maybe error spike or um, any, anything like that. Um, <clears throat> where the consumer, when it gets the new data, maybe it's a user ID uh, that uh, it would ask, okay, do you have anything on this user ID? And then gets, get a prediction from there. If not, then the cache uh, miss will result in some default answer. And in addition, in near real time, so <clears throat> the decision making is happening anyway, but then the consumer can schedule this new uh, data that doesn't have a prediction to actually fill in the cache on, on the back end. And hopefully by next time the, the, the same ID shows up, there is an answer. Same thing with features. So instead of um, caching predictions, we can cache features. Uh, the reason to do this is, for example, if I were to predict uh, probability of a, per of a purchase by a, a user, an internet user on this site, for, for this campaign, for this ad, uh, I cannot possibly enumerate and store all predictions of all the, all the combinations because there are so many users, hundreds of millions of users, uh, millions of sites, it's impossible to cache. It's too exp well, it's possible, but too expensive. So instead, I can store few features, make a simple model off of them, and consumer, uh, use the consumer in real time to, to do the predictions. All right. so. That's the kind of, I probably did not enumerate every possible scenario, and uh, I'm sure uh, there is more. These are the ones that I, I, I've seen uh, work, and there are pluses and minuses. So let's look still now, shift a little bit, and look at the evolution of machine learning system, go back to uh, research and uh, research prototype and production. So when we start with research, basically there is a lot of iteration. We, we tend to uh, focus the most on uh, building the model. And um, uh, this, this portion is usually done by data scientists and um, takes a lot of time. Uh, well, now it will maybe take less. But it's, it's, it's an it's a iterative process. That's the most important. Uh, once we know that we can actually build a, a model that is um, somewhat predictive, we want to put it together with, uh, the, uh, with the scoring system and try it on, uh, kind of prove that it works on production uh, data and have some notion of the design, uh, in pr or production design of the system. But when we go to production, we have to think about a lot more things such as data validation, error handling, monitoring, alerts, and all these other things that basically trump all the little effort of just making that one prediction, right? This, so this, um, maybe you can get away without, um, CI, CD, or, or, or maybe reporting is not, not the thing that you're worried about. But uh, generally, it has to be a conscious decision that, OK, we're not doing this. Uh, or if we do logging, what are we doing for logging? Why are we doing logging? Well, we get, for example, we need uh, logging to <clears throat> make sure that we can troubleshoot. And sometimes people just forget it, and, it's, and that happened. So. In production for machine learning, what 
I'm always looking for is um, fault tolerant systems. So we should expect problems always. We know as data scientists that sometimes we retrain the model, it does not converge. There is nothing anybody can do at that particular moment in time. We have to have a fallback. There has to be some, uh, the data did not arrive because something in ETL broke and um, basically you don't have your data. If, if that happens, there should be some fallback. Maybe it's yesterday's model if it's acceptable. Um, or if it's not acceptable, then it has to be something else. So essentially, we need to build systems where there is very low touch from humans and things that we can anticipate we should handle in code, not in uh, alerts and pagers and uh, uh, basically uh, have fire drills on, on every error. So this is technology. Let's talk about people. So there is a Conway's law. This is straight from Wikipedia. Uh, that any piece of software reflects the organizational structure that produced it. And uh, if you have two teams in an organization, and one of them is, um, has a task of building uh, a system, what tends to happen is that uh, that team will design the system in a way that minimizes the dependencies on other teams. Uh, because they don't control the resources, because the priorities are different, and basically that it, it happens all the time. Uh, and uh, the questions that we need to ask in, uh, res uh, with respect to machine learning systems is who is developing training, who is responsible for scoring, who is responsible for production systems on both sides of uh, training and scoring, how often do we deploy models, and who does that, and who is responsible for quality of the models. And uh, so there are some uh, patterns there. But before we go there, basically to put together a production system, you need all these different functions and people. It doesn't have to be that many people. But the functions are sort of there from product management to code deployment infrastructure. And very important is support. Right? So if it's not built up front, what, what happens is that um, all of a sudden, the system goes in production. There are all these, oh, there are always issues, and <laughs> you'll find your uh, data science team basically dealing with those issues all day, if it's not built up front. So, uh, the first scenario is uh, if data scientists are consumers. So, if I build a model in whatever I like, R, uh, Python, and uh, I have a data set, I can load it uh, and score it, and then make use of that maybe by making a report, maybe making that list for a um, fire inspector and delivering that list. And I, me as a data scientist, basically it's production, but I'm not, uh, it's, it's not real time usually and it's, uh, it's okay. Um, and this is the most common scenario where the data science team is separate from everybody else. Data, uh, let's, and let's consider this. So as a data scientist, I build a model in, let's say, Python um, that predicts something. And then there is this uh, tr transition where uh, I go and ask engineering to say, to put it in production. That's what we call it. Put, put, put my model in production, please. And uh, first of all, it's, it's a question of trust. And um, the engineer may look at my code, and if I'm not tra a trained you know, computer scientist coder, my code probably is not very uh, elegant. Let's put it this way. So uh, the engineer has to rewrite it because it's, it's impossible to, you know, uh, for, to put in production as is. Uh, by the time, then everything works in the end because, okay, so the code is rewritten, uh, takes time, long time usually, and then it's in production. A month after that, I want to make a change. And guess what? This whole thing starts again. And in, but in the meantime, the engineer is working on some other project. I cannot change the code because I have no idea how it works because it's completely rewritten maybe in a different language. And not to, not to mention, I may not able, be able to even touch it. Uh, as, as permissions go. And so this model is where, even though it's very common, it, it's not very efficient. So uh, an alternative, like a little step um, towards sanity, 
is uh, that we deliver as data science team, maybe we have engineers in the team, uh, we deliver predictions. So it's a data interface. It's very clean. It's a contract. And there are two teams. One produces the predictions, another consumes them. Everything is good. Uh, alternatively, uh, we can produce the model, and maybe it's a pickled model or, or something, and the scoring code itself lives in engineering, uh, it, or a serialized model could be just coefficients, linear coefficients, in which case the scoring code is actually a uh, code that, that makes the multiplications, uh, and that's, that also works. Uh, the um, next thing is that um, the data scientists produce both code and the data. Uh, so Poggio would be one of those. And then it goes straight into the engineering world. And then engineers take care of code deployment, uh, automation, testing, and everybody's happy, usually. But it takes a long time to agree on this interface. Uh, it can take months, actually, to negotiate how this whole thing works. Between the, between the teams. So the uh, scenario that worked the best for me is when data scientists work with engineers, and it happens actually really early on. Even during research, engineers are involved, even though it's not like a full-time engagement, maybe. Uh, but uh, the, the beauty of, of, of this is that uh, by the time research is done, uh, it's almost ready for a prototype. And by the time the prototype is done, it's practically ready to go in production. So this, this has been um, the most efficient way. And then when engineering works with data sciences, what ends up happening is that um, uh, they build tooling and they build platforms for data scientists to not redo the same things all the time. And so then data scientists are responsible for plugging in just the extraction code, like I get, get this data from this data store here, apply this transformation, that sort of thing. They're writing specifications and some code, but not the bells and whistles. And uh, the machine learning platform tell, takes care of all the production uh, uh, problems that, that uh, has to be done, that have to be done. And so I want to leave you with this picture in mind that basically production cannot be an afterthought. Uh, it's complex. We need to think about it upfront. And um, to conclude, basically, find the right problem, define your constraints, design components and interfaces, take into account organizational problems and organizational constraints. Um, and yes, it's a lot of work, but it's not rocket science. It can be done. Thank you. And yes, we, we do have time for questions. So we go to Slido, you've got your first question. Yes, so uh, any patterns for collecting consumer feedback on the predictions? So I assume this is a question more uh, for when the consumer is a human. And um, absolutely, so uh, in let's say, research um, in pharma, the consumer may be a chemist or biologist. They, they are the expert. Basically, it's a, it's a, uh, I'm, I'm interpreting this question as a question of how do you convince an expert that your system works. And it could be a doctor. It could be um, a trader who always traded on instinct. And now there is a model to saying, make this trade. And so the, um, the pattern that works usually is that you find in the organization somebody who is kind of more um, advanced in their understanding of uh, how machine learning can help them. And you get them on board. You work with them as a product, almost like a product manager works with a client, and get them on board and have their feedback and incorporate this feedback. When they see that basically you're helping them solve their problem, they become your champion. And then they, they go into the organization. You can use them as, as ambassadors. So I have, I have a follow on and, uh, on this, and maybe you answered it. So, so you had the model where sometimes the consumer just gets the prediction. Right? Yes. You have a data scientist, you just dump it. And, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> uh, and you know, a lot of what I hear uh, in, in the field is, how do I know my model's still valid? 
And a lot of it is to kind of see, you know, how do the predictions perform over time. So I don't know yes. if you have it. So, and part of that's collecting feedback on the actual as it's running in, in production. Uh, right. So uh, that's, go that's one slide that I threw out. And uh, in the uh, constraints and in the accuracy, uh, you need to measure in, in real, t like in production, essentially. It's not just the when during training. It's also in production. So what uh, I, I've done in the past is uh, you leave uh, some fraction, small fraction of predictions as random. And basically, you have your baseline of uh, what would have happened if, uh, uh, if you didn't predict. Or you, if, you, if, you, if you can split uh, in A-B test, then it's even better. Great. Oh, OK, I mean, I think uh, we're out of time. So I need to introduce the, the next speakers. Let's give Sergey uh, another round of applause.